It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. And as many of you know, that is the very beginning of a book by Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. Now, I'm not sure how well you remember it, but if you were like me, probably along the way in your education, you had to read this book, perhaps sixth or seventh or eighth or maybe even high school. But even if you don't remember, that's okay. Because the quote, it seems, is not just set to that one time. Now, admittedly, t Dickens was working about the French Revolution and a time about two, three hundred years ago. But that quote seems to transcend time. In fact, it's one of the most famous quotes of all English literature, if not all of literature. Many of you probably knew before I even gave you the reference that it was a, the best of times, it was the worst of times, came from that book. But what is Dickens getting at with that statement? What is he getting at with that quote? Perspective, right? How you look at things, how you look at life, how you view each and every day. And maybe another way we say this is, is your glass half empty or is it half full? Are you a pessimist or are you an optimist? Are you an enthusiast or are you a cynic? We ask these questions all the time, and though we would say that no one person always fits into one category or the other, we do know people who will be a pessimist at times. We know people who will be optimistic at times. And this carries into our worldview, how we view the world, how we view the culture ahead of us. Now, you can take a fairly pessimistic view. You can look at the world ahead of us, and you can say, we live in a culture that is immoral. True, right? It's not just pessimistic, it's true. We live in a culture that is full of sinners, full of evil, wicked people. You don't have to be a member of the church to know that. And so you can take a perspective that there is a no hope for this world. Things seem to get worse and worse. Babies continue to get murdered. People continue to live promiscuous lifestyles. The Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, prayer is out of the schools. Whatever are we to do? We can take a fairly pessimistic view of the world. Or we can also take an optimistic view. We can also look at the world and we can say, yes, we do live in a lawless world. We live in a world full of sinners, full of wicked people, full of evil people. But it's a world in need of hope. A world in need of comfort. A world that is in need of true hope. A world that God has not forgotten. A world that may be lost, but can and will be found by God. So is it the best of times? Or is it the worst of times? I'll leave you to think about that for just a moment. But as you do think about that, consider what it means if you would say that it is the worst of times. It's kind of hopeless for us to even have church, isn't it? It's kind of hopeless for us to even approach someone who doesn't know the gospel. It's kind of hopeless to even look outside our doors. And so we might as well close up shop if we adopt that hopeless view, that pessimistic view, that we are living in the worst of times. And how many people have done that? How many people have adopted that perspective of the world? They've looked at the world and they've said, there is no hope, so I'm going to keep trying for my family, for myself. But everyone else is on their own. That's kind of pessimistic, isn't it? It kind of brings you down even thinking about it, doesn't it? What about the optimistic view? Here we are, hearing some, a beautiful text from Revelation this morning. A text that brings comfort and strength to every Christian everywhere. Here again the promise from Revelation 7. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is the promise that we hold as Christians. That is the promise that we have. And we know that the time is short. We know that the time is coming. Look again at our Gospel. Matthew chapter 25. Those virgins, were, there was not a lot of time to come. And so you had the foolish and you had the wise. And if we take an attitude that there is no chance left, then the foolish virgins are left. There's no chance for them. They will only be left weeping. But that is not the world our God has left us in, is it? 
although there are tons of false predictions predictions and, and false prophets out there saying that there isn't any time left, there is time. There is time for a generation, for a people out there. There is time for us as the people of God to change the world, to change the lives of people. There is time for us as the people of God to look beyond the walls of our church, to look beyond the comfort, comfort of our church as fellow Christians around the world and see that there is a lost and a dying generation. So often, we use those words, Revelation 7, at a funeral. We use those words because we do know someone has died, but they had that comfort and that hope. Maybe there's been a funeral you've been at lately or recently, a a funeral that you've been to in the past where those words are read. And what comfort did that bring to you? Because you knew that that person, that saint who was baptized maybe right here at Grace Lutheran Church, you knew that that saint had been washed and cleansed. That at one time though, they were a sinner outside of God's grace. At one time, that person did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. At one time, they were separated from the Gospel. But the Spirit worked in their lives. The Spirit worked in their hearts. And He brought them to that faith. He brought them to that promise. And we know that promise. But what do we do? What do we do when we take this attitude? I don't think we can take a pessimistic attitude. Not if we look at the Word of God. Not if we truly believe what Scripture says to us. So often it's easy for us as Christians, though, to look at the world and say, there's nothing I can do. It is the worst of times. Greed. Possessions have taken over people's lives. Promiscuity. Pleasure has ruled the hearts of people. Even beyond that, the worship of self. The desires that I want, the things that I want, come first before all else. But we've seen time and again how these things don't help lives. These things destroy lives. These things tear lives apart. There is only one sure promise. There's only one sure hope. And that is the sure hope we have. The sure hope that we have in our Savior. And so we cannot, we cannot look at the world and say the worst of times. We can look at it and say it is the best of times. Because God has chosen this time in history to place us. He has chosen you out of, well, hundreds of thousands of millions of billions to to use you as part of His salvation plan. Have you ever thought of that? Thought of your life in that way? That God chose you to be part of His salvation plan. Have you thought about the opportunity He's placed in your life? That you do know Him as your Savior. That you do know Him, His promises. Have you ever thought about what that means for those who do not know God? Who you know those who do not go, know God, who are right around you each and every day. God can and will use you. Because our God, He cares. He cares about those who are lost. He cares about those who are dying without knowing Him. He cares about His people here at Grace. He cares about His people in churches around the country today and this week. But He also cares about those who do not yet know Him. He cares about those who, have, who are dying without that promise. In Luke chapter 19, He said Himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. In 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I don't know if you caught that part because I love to speed right to the end there. From that empty way of life. Redeemed from that empty heart. From that empty body. That life that was alone. See, there's a spot in each of us that we're made to know our Lord. We're built to worship Him. And when we don't have God in our lives, there's an empty spot there. There's an empty spot that only He can fill. There's a spot in our lives that only He can pour and make full 
that He can fill with those streams of life-giving water. Now many of you, many of you have been Christians your whole life. You've not known life without knowing God. But there are maybe some of you who haven't known Christ your whole life. Who haven't known those promises. Who have wrestled with that truth. And to see that difference. To see that life changed. Because there is power in God's Word. There is power to change us sinners into saints. To revive the dead among us and make us alive. Because we were dead in sin. We were dead in our trespasses and separate from God. Until we, by the Spirit, were invited to His presence. Washed and made clean. Maybe there's someone in your life now. Or there was someone in your life at one time or another who set that example for you. Who God used to affect your salvation story. For me, it was my mother and father. It was the example that they set as I was growing up. It was the requirement that they had that every Sunday I would be in church whether or not I was sick or not. It was the requirement that they had that I studied the Scripture not just in church, but at home. That It was the times that they came and they prayed with me before I went to bed. And I imagine if you look back, maybe it's your mother and father. Maybe it's a grandparent. Maybe it's an aunt. Maybe it's an uncle. Maybe... Maybe it's a friend. But there are people God has already used in your life, in your salvation story, to lead you to know Him. How might God be using you? See, to take an attitude of it is the worst of times, it's an excuse. It's an excuse to say that we can't, that we can't fight against the sin in this culture. It's an excuse to say that the church We'll just have to continue to burrow down and wait for the end to come. That's not at all what Christ said in Scripture, is it? It's not at all what we saw time and again. But in Christ's own example, He entered into human history. He took Himself out of eternity. Well, one foot in eternity, one foot into our world. He stepped into our world and made a change so that while we were yet sinners, that we could come to know Him. He made that change and He did it Himself, giving His own precious body and blood. He didn't ask someone else to do it. He didn't pay for it with silver or gold, but with His own body and blood on the cross. He redeemed you and He redeemed me. And He made us separate. He set us apart so that we could take part in the salvation story. And when we see through the eyes of God, when we look through His eyes, we, instead of seeing a world that is lost, a world that is dying, we will see a world that is hurting and a world that is in pain. We will see a world that is in need of our comfort and need of the true word of hope. We will see a world that they've turned to time and again to these hopeless options. Only the left hurting and wanting. Needing. Forgiveness of sins. And we are here to give that comfort and that strength. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, The Lord is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The Lord is patient. We oftentimes will say patient, slow to anger. He's waiting. He's waiting for all people to know Him. He's waiting for all people all people to come to a relationship with Him. And He's using us. Now sometimes it's hard for us, isn't it? Because we get caught up in the world as it is. We get caught up in the suffering of this world and we get caught up in the pain of this world. We get so used to it that we start to bring it into our spiritual lives. It starts to attack and corrupt our lives. And we start to believe things like it is the worst of times and there is nothing I can do to change it. We start to look at things and we start to grow hopeless ourselves. Wandering down those paths of despair. And this is exactly what Satan wants. He doesn't want us to see that we have a patient, loving God. Who that although we go through these times of suffering, that He is still working. That He is still, that He is still using His saints 
to share that good news. That word saints, it means holy, set apart. We are God's set apart children. His set apart children. To, t- to preach the good news. Now there are a lot of excuses. There are a lot of people who say, well, I know my salvation is sure. I know where I'm going. But that's another excuse, isn't it? Or another excuse is, I'm uncomfortable sharing my faith. Another excuse is, I'm too old, I'm too young. Another excuse is, that's the pastor's job. That's the elder's job. But those are just excuses. The whole people of God are saints. The whole people of God are set apart. The whole people of God are used by our Lord to preach that good news. One of my favorite authors is a theologian by the name of Bo Gertz. He wrote a book by the title, The Hammer of God. Excellent book. It's one of his fictional titles. But he also wrote a devotional entitled To Live With Christ. And he was a bit of a pietist, I admit that. And so his book focuses much of the time, the devotional, about our relationship with God and how it shows up in our lives. But there's one devotion that has stuck out in my mind. I'm on my second, way th- second time through this yearly devotion, and there's one that I haven't come to again yet, but since the first time I read it a couple of years ago, it stuck with me. And that is those who ask the question of why is there suffering? Why doesn't God bring it to an end? Why doesn't God bring us home where there is no more tears, no more fears, no more hunger, no more thirst? And while he was much more eloquent in his answer than I will be, the reason is, is God is still giving those, those who do not know him a chance. Those who who have never known him, those who have lost their faith, Our God is not a a malevolent God, malevolent master, waiting for us to mess up. He's not a malicious king, hoping to just weed out the bad ones. But he is a king who wore a crown of thorns on his head. He is a king who, out of love and mercy, desires all people to come to the knowledge of truth. He is a king He's a king who has washed us and made us clean through his own body and blood. And that is the hope we have. That is the hope that we have the best message of all. That is the message that we have to share with those who are outside the church. That is the message of hope that we have to share with those who who have lost their faith. Those who suffer each day. That is the message of hope that we have that brings encouragement. Right there at the end of 1 Thessalonians there. Did you see it? Paul said, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. Because this life is short. The suffering we experience on this life will come to an end. And there will no longer be tears. No longer pain. No longer hurt. But the promise that we will join with joy with our Lord in heaven. And that is the promise we hold to. That is the hope that we have. That is the assurance that we have that even when the world seems like it is the worst of times, even when it seems like the world is is in deep trouble, that our God is still patient. He is still loving and He still sees a people who need His love and mercy. And who better to share it than those who at one time were separate. Those of us who at one time were outside the kingdom. For we do indeed know that we were sinners. That we were broken. That we were evil and wicked. But we are now saints. Set apart to share the good news. The message we have, the message of the gospel, is one that can and will change the world. Indeed, it is the best of times. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray that you would empower us as your people to share your holy word, 
to share the good news of your gospel. We pray that you would not, that you would not look beyond us, but that you would look into each of our lives and see the needs of strength we have. See the needs that we have to share your gospel. Lord, take away the fears that we have, the discomfort that we have, and give us the assurance that with the message of hope that we have, it will change lives and it will change the world. Just as you used that message to bring light into darkness 2,000 years ago, you continue to bring light into our darkness each and every day. May that message always be quick to our lips, sure to our hearts, and may we know with assurance your peace which has no end. Amen.